and I can't see your faces, but um, thank you for coming. And thank you to uh, Miriam, Stevie, Tanya, and Lizzie for being here, especially. Um, uh, Why We Cook is a book that celebrates the achievement of women in food uh, all across the culinary spectrum. And uh, there are over a hundred women contributors in the book and four of them are right here with us tonight, which is such an honor. And I'm especially happy that these four are here because they were um, some of the first four contributors to join the project. Um, and when I think back to the whole process of working on this project, um, the people that I got to know and meet in the Bay Area uh, are some of the first that come to mind because um, that was really sort of the uh, center point of so many of the conversations that led to me gathering the courage to actually make this idea into a book. So um, thank you all so much for being here. And um, before we go on, I just wanna, I wanna make sure that um, we kind of cover all of the amazing things that you are all up to in your own lives and mm -hmm. professions. Um, and so before we kind of launch into conversation, I would love it if we could just go around and um, if you'd introduce yourselves. So let's start with Tanya. I'm just looking at my screen. I don't, it's probably different on everybody's screen, but let's go Tanya, Lizzie, Miriam, Stevie. Great. Hi everyone, um, Tanya Holland. I am the chef and owner of Brown Shirt Kitchen in Oakland. And, um, yeah, I'm really happy to be a part of this project. It's it's just a lovely book and some of my favorite people are part of it as well. And uh, Lindsay made the, the process very pleasant. <laughs> um, what have I been up to? Um, you know, trying to run my restaurant, try to, trying to sustain it um, during the pandemic. And um, I've been fortunate enough to have great support from uh, the community, from investors and, um, you know, we're still here, which is great. And during the course of that, I launched my podcast, Tanya's Table Podcast. Um, it was sort of a TV show treatment in the works. This podcast opportunity, opportunity came about just before the pandemic. And then during the pandemic, I was able to access a lot of people that I dreamed of having. Um, they just happened to have more time on their hands, wonder why. <laughs> Uh, so that's the way that happened, and I had a lot of fun doing that. I love, you know, having uh, intimate conversations with people. Um, and then while I was doing that, I got a request from um, the talent manager at OWN about um, creating a show for them. So we did a seven-episode show called Tanya's Kitchen Table, and that was really fun. Um, and we don't know about a season two yet, but, you know, I'm just happy to have done that. I did Selena Gomez's... Um, her show on HBO Max. And so a lot of great opportunities happened for me in terms of my own personal, um, you know, media branding. And then with the restaurant, just, you know, being able to get that stabilized. And um, I mentioned to um, uh, the rest of the, the panel earlier that I'm planning to open up a cafe in the Oakland Museum of California called Town Fair. It was supposed to open last August and we hope to open it sometime in um, June or July. So I'm really looking forward to that. It's gonna be a very different uh, culinary experience than what I've been doing for the past few years. It's gonna represent the diaspora of Oakland and I hope to invite a lot of my colleagues to do pop-ups and be involved. And um, that's, that's the bulk of what I'm up to. Oh yes, and working on my third cookbook. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just a, oh, yeah, just a just, few things. Yeah. <laughs> called California Soul, the, um, it'll be out next fall. So we are just winding up um, the manuscript and doing the photo shoot in a few weeks and it's, it's great. Wow, okay, next fall, 2021 or 2022? 2022, yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks, Tanya. Sure. Thank All right. Lizzie. All right, am I up? Well, that yeah. was, that's quite a tough one to follow, Tanya. <laughs> um, I am Elizabeth Binder. I'm the chef and owner of Handcrafted Catering, which is a uh, boutique catering company based here in the Napa Valley. 
Um, I was born and raised in South Africa, um, have been lucky enough to travel the world and uh, cooking has, um, has been a great sort of way for me to work in kitchens, um, some of the best kitchens all over um, throughout the UK, um, France, um, Australia, and then before I landed here in the Bay Area. Um, when I first landed here, I was um, introduced to Tracy Desjardins at Jardiner, and I was on her opening team for Jardiner. And um, that kind of introduced me to um, this area and, um, and sort of the food industry in, in the States. Um, I went on to open Bar Bambino, uh, which was an award-winning restaurant um, based in the Mission District in San Francisco, um, a restaurant that I'm incredibly proud of, um, before sort of moving up to Napa and opening Handcrafted Catering. Um, so last year was sort of as we all adjusted and kind of figured ourselves out, um, you know, we started the year doing these like great South African pop-ups and, and sort of, you know, having quite a lot of, doing quite a lot of creative fun things. And then everything sort of came rolling to a stop. Um, but one of the things that has come out of this past year that I just really value is um, having quality time with my own family. Um, I'm married to a chef. And so there's obviously a lot of cooking going on in this house, but um, it also, we quite stretched for time. And so one of the sort of, you know, the blessings of this last year has been just that reconnection. Um, and Lindsay, I have loved being part of this book. It was such a beautiful book from the beginning. Um, so oh, thank you for thank including you. me. All your beautiful illustrations and just your generosity um, with, your, <laughs> with your beautiful art. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, and I have two children and a dog and a cat. <laughs> <laughs> Very sort of normal household. <laughs> for all the chefing. <laughs> Do they all love to cook? Um, yeah, I mean, they all like good food. <laughs> There's a lot of, yeah, the kids are definitely, um, I always say Zadie's my pasta making princess. And uh, Ben is my seasoning steady hand, you know? So. Love it. Oh. All right, Miriam, you're up. I also have a cat. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am Miriam. I own a creative consulting company called Miriam and Company based in Napa. I am originally from New York, upstate New York, and have been in food and beverage my entire career which may not seem like a long time, but I've been in the industry for a little over 10 years now, um, really focused on, on beverage, but with that comes a lot of intersection with food and sustainability professionals and farmers and advocates and, and activists. So um, my role from the beginning has kind of just been at the intersection of all of those folks. Um, and that was what led me to work for the Culinary Institute of America previously, uh, before opening my own company. I worked there for five years and oversaw all of our public education initiatives. So anything from learning about the history of Napa for 90 minutes up to a five day long cooking class, learning about farm to table cuisine or just basic skills in the kitchen. Um, I was there for, like I said, about five years and started my company in, in officially in August. I'd been working uh, for some time, but, and I also founded the Diversity in Wine Leadership Forum in, um, in August as well. It's funny now that I think about it, but I had the help of Elaine Chukon Brown in getting that started. And I think we'll probably talk about it later, but the premise was to bring together leaders of organizations in the wine industry, specifically organizations dedicated to diversity and equity within the industry, so that we could facilitate collaborative conversation and creative problem solving and, you know, move everything forward as fast as possible. And lastly, I'm a partner in a company called Plate Kitchen, um, which is a space for foodie fun. So we focus on instructing the consumer around um, conscious 
food choices and cooking at home as well as of course beverage because that is my passion. So those have been all things to unfold in the last give or take 12 months for me. Um, but what I've enjoyed or what I've been able to take, I guess, from the last year is this real sense of community. My previous role, I traveled a lot and I absolutely loved that, but it's been really great to connect with my community in Napa and to watch that community grow. Um, and as a hobby, also really get into my garden and, and back into my kitchen because I was not able to be in my kitchen as much. And now I've been able to cook a lot more. So uh, I will add that I like going to the book mine too, because Naomi Sarah just talked <laughs> about the book mine. So I spent a lot of time reading this year <laughs> too. Thank you. Um, it's incredible hearing about, I mean, sorry, before we move on to Stevie, uh, it's just kind of incredible to hear the incredible amount of uh, action that's been happening in a really, really challenging time. So sidebar, let's go on, Stevie. <laughs> yeah, I have like so much imposter syndrome right now. I mean, you haven't really been uh, resting on your laurels yeah. over there. So let's, yeah. I just sell wine and drink it and eat my food. <laughs> um, really, like it is a huge honor to be here. I still feel like I more and more often am in, invited to sit at a, a table with these amazing inspirations, like women um, and people that I have long looked up to. I mean, I remember the first time Tanya Holland came into my wine shop and I was like, <laughs> Oh my God. And it, it's quite a, a huge honor for me to get to sit alongside her and y'all and Lindsay, like what you've done is really, really special. It, it speaks volumes of um, you and your personality and charisma um, that you are able to gather such forces. So I'm really, really um, humbled to be in that presence. All that aside, besides selling wine, um, I, so I own Bay Grape Wine Shop, which is, um, our flagship location is in Oakland and we have just opened in Napa Valley one month ago. Um, so yeah, during the pandemic, um, I expanded my business, um, which is strange and we can talk about that more later if you want, but um, uh, that's been very fun. And I pivoted a number of times my restaurant, Mama Oakland, um, and then ultimately made a decision to indefinitely close it and sort of wait and see what God decided was the way for that. And um, we have just made a decision in the last week and a half to reopen. Um, and I'm really excited about that. Um, so we're currently now in basically entirely new like opening mode, um, doing all of the things. And then I also um, founded an organization called uh, Batonage, which was um, created in 2017, sort of um, aftermath of Me Too movement, 2016 election. And really, I just wanted to um, start to have frank, honest conversations about the challenges and opportunities that faced women in the wine industry. So I thought it would be a little small thing and like just a few of us would get together and it has really bloomed into, um, I think something pretty profound for our industry and our greater community. Um, and it's now going beyond just having the conversations to trying to really chart like positive forward progress and create solutions to some of the challenges. Um, so I've had the privilege of sitting with Miriam in a lot of these conversations with other leaders in that diversity, equity, and inclusion space, um, which again, I feel like imposter syndrome to have, but it's really, um, again, an honor. So now we've launched the mentorship program and we're really trying to start at the ground level with um, creating the next generation of wine professionals and having them look and act and express the values that we, um, I think all gathered here, believe should be inherent to the food and wine industry. 
and yet clearly are not yet. So um, the mentorship program launched a few months ago. So I've been busy with that as well. And I have a dog and a kid. Because everybody's talking about their dogs and kids now, apparently. <laughs> Side note, a dog and a kid. Um, so, okay, while you are on the heels of that introduction about batonage, um, could you, but I would, first of all, I would love to raise a glass to all of you. Um, and while we, before we actually officially toast, could you tell us a, just a little bit about what we're drinking? I'm going to hold up this gorgeous, Yeah. it's a can. It's a can. Um, canned wine so hot right now. So batonage, um, like any organization, um, there's still that it's probably backwards. Money to do a lot of the things that we wanted to do. And um, personally, I think one of my shortcomings is fundraising, but I'm great at thinking up ideas and ways to um, get people excited and sell things. And so I was like, what if we like made something that we could sell? We should make a wine. And then I reached out like, literally had a thought, reached out to my friend, Kristen, who is a co-founder of a label called Nomadica, which is all canned wines. Um, some way curated, um, they're made with really incredible winemakers um, who are working with vineyards that are sustainable and organic. So it's all of the things that we care about. Um, and Kristen and her partner um, are, LGBT, LGBTQ and women in LA. And I was like, this is everything. So I was just like, would y'all ever want to like make a canned wine with us with Batonage and like, we'll sell it and we can basically like take all the profits and dump it back, in, back into the Batonage mentorship program. Um, Perfect. Appeared. <laughs> and so we did that. And <laughs> Um, Alicia Summer, who is a Napa um, photographer who does these beautiful uh, self-portraits. Um, and that's who we asked if, if we could borrow her artwork to put on the label. And it just, to me, felt like so evocative of this like spirit of um, positive forward progress. So she made the labels. We're selling them at Bay Grape and a handful of other um, women owned um establishments around the country and everyone that's participating is done can i get some can i get some, <laughs> can I get some to sell who's distributing it um so there were a limited batch and we basically first we asked nomadica how much they could make and donate and then we reached out first and foremost to the other um mentors in the mentorship program so mostly retailers and then some sommeliers, sorry. Next round for sure. Um, and it's been amazing because I was like, I don't know if anybody is even gonna wanna do this. It's a big ask in the time of COVID to be like, do you wanna just sell product for free? Um, but everyone that we asked was like, yes. And so we moved through the amount that Nomadica had uh, like immediately and all of that money, it's like, it's gonna be like $15,000 is going into the mentorship program. So the future hope wow. the mentorship program would also then become like all of the mentees would help make the wine in a given year. And then the proceeds would go back to the program so that people interested in viticulture could be a mentee and could learn throughout the year about the viticulture that goes into making the wine. People can make the wine, the salespeople could sell the wine, the retail people could have it in their shops and the sommeliers could pour it. So that's the future hope. Um, it's really exciting to me. That's incredible. And um, cheers to that. And cheers to what it, what was your phrase? You said positive Positive um, forward progress. Positive forward progress. Cheers. And thank you to you, Stevie, for providing the wine to all of us and shipping it across the country to me. Yes. An honor. It's really good. Very tasty. Um, okay. So that was, I mean, it's so incredible hearing all of you talk about all the things that you're doing. It kind of makes my head spin. Um, in the best way. And the, just to think about the amount of experience and wisdom that four people contain 
Um, I'm so honored that you are part of this project and that you said yes to me when I reached out to you and none of you knew me. <laughs> um, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about and tell people a little bit about what that experience was like, because um, to me, it's just so emblematic of the warmth and generosity of the hospitality industry and, um, and the power of these relationships and connections and communities within the, in, within the industry. Um, and so, okay, so when I first started the project, uh, I was living in Oakland. I'm not living in Oakland anymore. Um, I had given a lot of thought to the overlaps between my two creative processes that were really important to me in my life at that, at that time, illustration and cooking. And I kept thinking about why I, I was coming back to cooking in this way that felt more significant than just sort of a, um, an everyday chore or task. Um, it was sort of haunting me, these questions about like what it meant to me and uh, what I was passing down to my daughters. I have two, two daughters, they were, um, they were, five and two at the time they are now five and eight um and uh so i was thinking a lot about it, all these questions and i was working on these ideas in my studio and i started to talk to the women in my own life about these sort of questions of identity and like how i was balancing all of these uh, all of the tasks in my life and all of the responsibilities and then all of the um creative processes that were feeling really important. And then those, I, I thought if I'm, if I'm thinking about this, but I don't necessarily have a place that I can go turn to, to read about it uh, in other people and what other people think about it, I'm sure there are other women that are also thinking about these same questions. And so my, my research process just sort of started to expand. And at the same time, um, being in the Bay area was, incredible because it is such a uh, incredibly rich and diverse place full of talented creative in you know genius people doing all sorts of amazing things and um i got to go see a uh an event at la cocina which was um was an annual event that 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 organization puts on uh called um, food and voices, what's it called? F and B food, food and voices from the industry. And it's, uh, it's a, uh, writers and, um, people in the La Casina community reading essays. Um, so that was one thing I got to go do. And then the other was, I went to a panel that was organized by Miriam at CIA in Napa. And, the panel was a discussion following um, a screening of a documentary, which I highly recommend called A Fine Line. And, uh, and then on the panel were Tanya and Libby and several other women who are um, in Why We Cook now, in addition to Miriam. Um, and so the funny story that I tell about that evening is that at the time my kids were really little and I was driving up from Oakland and I was totally stressed out. We were doing a like family trade off. Like my husband got home from work. I zipped out the door. I had to drive an hour to Napa. There was tons of traffic. I was super late. I was also really nervous because I was just um, an artist with an idea and <laughs> not part of the culinary world. Um, just totally thinking like, this is crazy. Uh, so I hap I walked in really late to the event and I got one of the last seats in the auditorium, loved screening the movie, listening to the discussion. And then I happened to walk out at the end behind all of the panelists. And so when they filed into the room where everyone was gathering, I was right there next to all of them. <laughs> and so, uh, I, it was one of those moments where I, I was super nervous. And I also thought to myself, this is like, this is my moment, I have to just go for it. And so um, I just started introducing myself to people and telling them a little about the idea. And on the inside, it was shaking in my boots. Um, and then after that, you know, I got to follow up with Miriam and uh, 
the reason I'm telling this story is because I think that it says so much about how um, how generous and welcoming this community of women has been. And I say community of women, many of the people in Why We Cook don't know each other. Many of them do, but the experience was consistent throughout that uh, the, the women that I interviewed and met were uh, completely open, sometimes very vulnerable with what they shared with me, um, enthused, willing to, um, connect me to other people that they thought would be interested in talking to me about the project. Uh, so in any case, I say that because I think that this sort of um, thread runs through all of all of your work, the four of you that are here today. And I, um, I wondered if you might just talk a little bit about sort of how um, community building and um, these relationships that you form naturally in your work is important to what you do because I see it from my perspective and I see that um, the more achievement and success you all have, the more people you're lifting up with you. So um, maybe I could, let's start with Mariam, because I feel like you were at the at the center of that whole story <laughs> from the beginning. So maybe you could start and and then let's go Stevie, Tanya, Lizzie. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I mean, I say this all the time, but the book and the project was not even a, a, a thought as far as was it possible it was just like who is who is the next conversation that Lindsay can can have with and like make this thing happen and um I was glad that that was the reception across the board as it should be um for me community it, it's not just the feel good of having support it's also the reward of having the challenge I have women, especially in my life, who help me think bigger, um, who make me dream bigger. I, in my work, I spend a lot of time helping other people get their ideas off the ground. <laughs> um, and I have friends who don't let me forget the validity and importance of my own ideas. And that really goes for my community within food and beverage. Um, I think one, one thing that's really important to me in when we talk about community building is listen first and speak second. Um, I am often the last one to speak uh, in, a, in a room because I love to listen and understand how I might support someone or to hear something that I might help challenge a perspective on in a positive way. Um, and also so that it's sustainable. It's, it's not just a give relationship and it's not just a take relationship. And there are many women, especially the women in this book that I think have built careers on this understanding of we all, we all level up together, you know? And I think that's just so important. I can, I can say confidently each of the women here, including Naomi, <laughs> are all women of that nature. And I don't know that it's just food and beverage, but there's something about women that come together around a table where that's like where the action is, you know, that's where things are happening. Even women around a Zoom table. I just saw it happening before we started. <laughs> so um, it's very important. I, I couldn't do my job without community building though, as a consultant and as someone in the wine industry, as an advocate, I couldn't do it without the community. Um, Who's next, Lindsay? I can't remember who you called on. Evie. Evie. Um, I call Miriam the enabler, um, which not in a negative way, you know, that word often <laughs> a connotation, but I really think of her as the person that like, great, I can help you make this happen. I admire it so much about her. Um, I don't know what to say other than like community is the most important thing to me. Like it is everything. It is the thing that I literally in the business plan said was like the goal of my business was creating community. Um, I don't know what to do without it. And it's part of the reason that I struggled so, so hard with the last year. 
I mean, I had a really, really bad first part of the pandemic. Like nothing matters because everything that I care about is community. And it was wholeheartedly stripped away and told that like, it was bad, um, dangerous, like, that did not, to put it lightly, sit well with me. Um, and yeah, I don't know, the, the Zoom thing, like this is fun, but like, it's not really, it's not the same. I don't know, um, it still continues to be a struggle for me. And, like I'm fully double vaccinated and all my friends who are like, we are having all of the dinner parties because um, it, it, it is everything to me um and I it doesn't feel like I do it with an intention of like oh I need to like raise people up I mean yeah I guess I do that's wonderful but like it might be kind of selfish just because like I really like people I'm very extroverted um and I love seeing my friends like realize their potential it gives me the greatest joy so um, Miriam's the enabler and I'm the instigator. I'm constantly instigating, like, you should do it, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> yeah, so. Well, I'm gonna give myself a title. Well, I'm gonna share a title that a, a colleague gave me the other day, which is, she called me a social pollinator. Ooh, and, pollinator. And, yeah, I'm gonna own that because I love connecting people. And that's what I love about this community. And Stevie knows, I mean, yeah, I mean, I miss like just popping in Bay Grape and saying hi and, you know, and the, that randomness, who else is going to be in the shop that day? You don't know. Like we, we don't get to have that randomness of connection, you know, in um, the pandemic, which is for me has, you know, personally, that's been um, something that I miss. You know, you never know who's coming into your restaurant, um, who you're going to fall, you know, run into if you're out at one of your favorite spots. Um, but yeah, I've been building community and I was just speaking about this over the past couple of days to a couple of different parties. That's, that's really the name of the game in this business is these relationships that you build over time. I credit all of my, you know, my media success to, these are relationships that I've been building for 30 plus years. You know, now I have colleagues who are the, the ones who are pulling the strings at you know the big publications or the networks or you know they know who I work for and and those people can vouch for me or whatever um, and yeah I'm, I'm I've always been a woman's woman I love supporting you know my women friends lifting them up and um, you know I think mentoring and inspiration can come from all different directions so you know I'm inspired by people who are younger than me, like Stevie and Miriam, who are so like, and you are too, I'm sure Lizzie and Lindsay, but I mean, <laughs> I've seen those two in action, just really going for it and creating. And that makes me want to do better and do more and, and be there for them in any way that I can help them. And, um, you know, we have to keep that cycle and that circle going. Is it me? Um, hi. So um, <laughs> for me, I, you know, I've never really thought about like um, being specifically like, hey, I'm going to introduce these people because we're in food and we're women. Um, you know, it was just always it's just always been that way. People were so generous to me when I left South Africa, you know, really young, didn't know anything about the rest of the world and just wanting to go and cook and um people and it was mainly women um who introduced me to other women and maybe they either knew them or they knew of them but made introductions and I feel like you know I got to travel around the whole world and work and and work and cook and you know see and do and it was all because people introduced me to people and I just you know, it's not something I consciously do. I just do it because people have done it for me. And I think it's just, you just do it because it's the, it's the right thing to pass along. You know, I think we all, we all kind of do that. Anyway, I'm very well, grateful. I, yeah. You know, I, 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 sorry. Some people are antisocial. You're, you're special. I mean, 
especially after the pandemic, people are like scared and awkward and <laughs> to get back to people feeling like that's an inherent thing and that I do see as part of our job. But Lizzie, I mean, I, I haven't even met you in person. I can already tell like, yeah, you want to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's something, I mean, I think, you know, while you all were talking, it's, a, it's, it occurs to me that that's something that is and has been the one of the hardest parts of the last uh, 15 months is that spontaneity that is such a joyful part of hospitality in no matter if you're you know in the back of the house or in the front of the house or um, working in wine or in food what have you I think that um, that generosity and the extrovert part of all of you and the gathering part of all of you has been totally challenged in this time. Um, so, I mean, not to be a total downer, but I did want to talk to you all about how you have um, been persevering through this moment and, um, and, and what a massive change you have all been through since I first met you in 2018, 2019. Um, which is, I mean, it's kind of incredible to think about not just what's happened in your uh, in your professional lives individually, but also what we've all experienced um, communally, globally. So um, I just wanted to, before I, I we talk about that, I just wanted to read a couple of quotes that I thought were particularly uh, prescient from what you said to me in, uh, interviews for the book about perseverance. And um, this was in 2019, so keep that in mind. Uh, Stevie, I, I asked the question was, what obstacles have you overcome to get where you are today? And what have those experiences taught you about perseverance? Stevie, um, this is a part of your quote. You said, basically the idea is that the approach is yes and. And you said, yes, this is a massive struggle and I can still try again. Yes, these emotions and anxieties feel like too much and I won't stop. What I've learned about perseverance is you just do the damn thing. And then Tanya, your answer to the question was, everyone fails. It's the ones who persevere who ultimately win. So, okay, so that was two years ago and think about what we've been through since then. Um, how have you all pushed through in the last 15 months? How, like, where have you summoned your perseverance from and um, what have you learned from it? And, and what do you want to stick with you from that experience as we move forward? Um, let's start with, uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> let's see, let's start with Tanya and then we'll go backwards this time, Tanya and then Lizzie, and then Stevie, and then Miriam. Yeah, I'm happy to go. Um, I mean, it's it's so amazing. Like, thank you for the gift to have that chronicled because I mean, for me, and I think a lot of us here, type A doers, we're, we don't rest on our laurels. We're not looking backwards. We're like moving forward. And I mean, I've lived like three lifetimes since 2019, you know, and um, I would, I didn't even have like the failures that I now have. I have more failures. <laughs> you know, I closed the ferry building location. Um, I'm terminating a business partnership. Like there's, there, you know, there's just all sorts of stuff. And, and I don't, I mean, are they really failures? They're kind of like, they're, they were learning opportunities. Some of them more expensive than others, which is the unfortunate part. That's where, that's where the failure is for me. It's just the expense that I had to learn at. And that's where I say to our industry, we have to have more access to information and equity in, you know, in that way so that you know, and, th and that's also why I like to share my knowledge because I don't want anyone to have to make the same mistakes that I've made because it's very expensive and not everybody can recover from it. Um, so, you know, for me, I think, you know, this question has come up a lot recently and I just like, I have my eye in the prize, I have a vision 
and I believe in myself. And even though I have moments where I'm just like, I just am ready to move to Maui and open a fish shack. Um, <laughs> I think about, I look around the industry and I don't see enough people looking like me doing what I aspire to do. And I know that I'm so close that I got to keep doing it for the culture and for the community. And, you know, not to, not in a, you know, um, to be a martyr, but in a way that just to continue to open a door um, and to leave some kind of legacy. I don't have kids, I don't have dogs, so. <laughs> my legacy is gonna be left to, you know, whoever's in this industry um, after me, um, who, you know, gets to see someone who looks like them doing what they, you know, they wanna do. And like I said, I've been fortunate to have a lot of support around that vision. And that has also helped lift me up. But um, as I'm sure you all know, when you are, the uh, the founder of your organization or whatever you're doing it, it's lonely at the top and so it definitely you know it's it's challenging and yeah COVID and all the isolation has um you know we don't get that immediate gratification that we used to always get with like guests coming in like oh that was yummy you know they're taking it home and yeah they're posting and they're saying stuff but it's not the same of you know that's where I, I find, for me, I find my joy less in cooking and more in hospitality. I really just love um, providing an experience for people that's memorable and um, just, you know, paying attention to all those different details that create that experience. Thank you, Tanya. Um, I, don't, I don't really have anything profound to say, um, but I... I just, for me, it's just like, do what you can do, you know, like it's whatever I could do. I know, you know, I'm going to do what I can do, like just get through this. You know, it's not, you know, not always grand. It's not always, you know, big, but you just kind of, you just make it happen. And for me, it's the most important thing is this little family, you know, they've just, they've all got to get through this too. And for me, that's been a huge, this last year has been really, really more about them than than my business you know um and and that's kind of like just on a bigger scale before the pandemic that was one of the things for me that was a big trial was you know running a restaurant and then saying hey this is not working anymore this 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 dynamic's not working for these little people in my life i need to figure something another way out another way to do what i love and still contribute financially but be able to be there for them and so you know you just you find a way and I am so grateful to cooking and food and everything that it has given me you know it's given me travel it's given me a creative outlet um, it's it's given me a way to earn money and I um, and I'm incredibly grateful not only for that but for the whole community and all the people that I've met along the way I have to say, um, when I met you and interviewed you the first time, when we when we talked the first time, you told me stories about when your uh, I think your son was born. Who, which was your first? My son, child, yeah. your son, and when you were still um, at Bar Bambino, which was one of my favorite restaurants when I lived in San Francisco, and um, and like I remember you telling me about him being swaddled on the on the butcher block in the kitchen, like shoved up like his like napping Ostracy. on the counter in the kitchen. <laughs> and I think you know that is um yeah I mean yeah anyway I just wanted to throw that little anecdote in there because it's such a good visual uh of what uh, you were talking about yeah gosh yeah. that was yeah there was so little and it was I was there so much and um you know they would have their nap and they would fall asleep and I would like then I would sh put him up on the on the counter and like put um, dish towels down and try and make it as soft as possible and then cover him with dish towels and then hope to God he didn't roll off, you know. So you put like <laughs> cling, set, cling film box or something just to like break the, you know, like just to keep him in there. A um, couple like of cabbages that. or something. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> a lot of. Uh... There was a lot um, of that or sticking them in the, um, in the, uh, you know, the sink, cause it was like containable, you know, so he would just be in the big, <laughs> vegetable sink, but 
in the pantry in the pastry section but he was like contained so the pastry she was the the girl in the pastry department she would be making all the cakes and feeding him like dried fruit and he would be like couldn't couldn't get out you know he was like stuck <laughs> but um you know he couldn't like get it. hurt while we were there anyway i love it okay I stevie those kinds of stories i mean i feel like we tell them later and everybody's like charming like so cute you did it and then <laughs> it was a shit show like <laughs> not fun it was not fun for me to like try to balance that and I know you think it's cute now and that like that's the inspo image on insta but like no it's not fun there's no, a lot I can agree with you more it's not fun at the time no at the time it's overwhelming yeah really and you're like why yeah. my life this is awful I'm like the worst mother I'm the worst boss it's like so bad um so yeah I just I feel I'll always the need to remind the audience that like when that cute story is told that, like it might be funny and charming now but like in the moment it was not um oh yeah, yeah and I guess I mean I don't know I I personally like really struggle with this question right now because yes I still believe that it's it's yes and like every, it was really hard everyone ha I, I don't think that Lindsay said this part of the quote but it was like everyone has shit like we just don't really talk about it and so the part that is captured is the inspiring like pick up when things become good again or you like show your perseverance and like, I don't think there's enough of the storyline or enough imagery dedicated to like the really bad parts where you're not like emerging like a phoenix, but you're like covered in poop and like crying and like <laughs> all of your employees hate you. And like, you know, it's just like, there's so much badness. And I went through it this last year. And so it's easy to be like, yes and you just do the damn thing like yeah you do but like I don't want anybody to think that I am the type of person that's just like okay like cheerful about it like no there was a lot a lot of grief and like I was quoted in another book like what got me through this year was alcohol and antidepressants and like I don't have any shame about saying that like I don't want people to be inspired by the like pretty image of me I want them to be inspired by the like fuck she also had it really bad and everything was a mess and she was not a good person in those moments and there was shame and guilt and like she still came out of that. That's the story that I care about sharing or perpetuating. Yeah. Miriam? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Say something. Um, I feel so fortunate because um, <laughs> we've had a lot of the same conversation on our own on hikes when we need to go throw rocks at trees or whatever, <laughs> throw rocks into the air for no reason or move um, to move through it. Um, I think we use the word grief. And I think, you know, we are all over a year into this and grief is not a strange word to anyone's ears, but the obstacle for me more than anything else was that I was very much I was so proud of everything we had built at the CIA and something completely out of our control at the time it felt like took it all away. And I could imagine business, everyone, not just business owners, you know, anyone who's put their time and effort into building something from scratch. That was really tough. Um, Specifically for me, the grief was, I, I was really ready to step into to this new phase and supported in that by my colleagues and peers. I just wasn't ready to step in it, uh, into it, like not on my terms. And it felt very much like where my grief came from was how responsible I felt for everyone else that I was working with 
alongside of and that reported to me, making sure their livelihoods were protected and, and then just feeling a little bit like this legacy slip away. And I had really pivotal conversations with people who had built that with me, who said, it's not that it is gone, it existed and it's out there and it had impact and continues to have impact, including being able to have a conversation like tonight because of the work. Um, so it took, it's not, grief isn't a straight line, um, but I think the obstacle for me was coming to terms um, and, and, and coming to terms with everyone's challenges too at the same time. Um, but what I got out of it was similar to what Tanya said, yes, there have been like trials and errors for sure, but this sort of like ingenuity around the situation. And um, Lindsay and I talked about this last week actually, but this difference between being strong and trusting yourself. And for me, coming out of all those obstacles wasn't, I'm strong, I can push through this. I am such a warrior, like none of that. It was, okay, really, really tough shit happened. And I trust myself, you know, strength is, strength is a variant. Trust is like, okay, I'm right there. Um, so obstacles, but this like inherent new trust in, in, in myself, but in my community too. Um, that's a perfect segue for, and, um, Naomi, tell me if we're running out of time, but I, we could just keep talking all night, but I, um, I wanted to ask you all a little bit about what is giving you hope right now on the other hand of that same question, which is <clears throat> you started to talk about this, um, you know, a little bit about what you've learned through the experience and sort of what's changed since we, since we first met, but as you look forward, um, what what gives you hope in this moment and what is making you feel inspired and um and as you look to the horizon i guess uh miriam let's go backwards um what's giving me hope tanya's opening a new restaurant <laughs> And Stevie opened a new wine <laughs> and I'm working on an event with Lizzie again. And I get to like be part of these conversations and we're all here. I, I mean, what is hopeful about that? Um, I will also say day to day, getting my hands in the dirt and working in my garden gives me hope. This keeps me really, really focused on the things that are important and the things that ground me, no pun intended, but pun intended. <laughs> um, I helped plant your garden there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, w I could be cheeky and I could say alcohol and antidepressants, but, <laughs> but beyond that, um, dinner parties. Um, as I mentioned to the rest of the panel, just before we actually jumped online, like we got to have one last night. It was a whole group of fully vaccinated people in Napa outside. It was a glorious evening. It was like filled with what I see as the best and brightest, most genuine, exciting, inspiring, humble, diverse people in the Napa Valley and to just like sit there and really soak in like what it means to be in that community right now and like to see the potential of like how we can all like change this world was like I had to take a moment for myself it was really really inspiring so dinner party I'll second you on the dinner party. Sorry, <laughs> but, um, I was we like we were we spent um, a Sunday at your at the New Bay Grape um, like two weekends ago or something, and then the other night we went for drink. We again all vaccinated, so vaccines give me so much hope. 
And um, and then the other night we went, we did a pub crawl in Napa. <laughs> I was like, what? That was so divine. It was like, oh my gosh, it felt so almost normal. And oh, so normal. I'm with you on the dinner parties and that people are hiring. People, when people start hiring again, that means things start moving. And I can see it just in our community. People are hiring and that's, that's good. That's good stuff. It just means we're going to be cooking for dinner parties as well. <laughs> not just cooking, not just doing them for ourselves. Anyway. Um, well, dinner parties have always been my inspiration. That's how my love of food and hospitality began. My parents' dinner parties and then my own. Um, I'm inspired by all of the new, even though we're not in person, there's all these great new open conversations happening about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Things I've been talking about for decades um, <laughs> and you know the lack of access and all that. And I'm really happy that people who don't look like me are talking about it. And um, the people who look like me are getting more of a platform and a voice. And that's it's really inspiring. I also wanna say you know, for the four of us on the panel um, who are really in the industry, it's not for the faint of heart. And that's why not everybody does it, you know? Yeah, that has become uh, abundantly clear to me, the more and more people that I get to know through this process. And especially as the conversations have continued through the book coming out, um, it's been incredible hearing about uh, how creative and how deep people have dug to make it through this moment. And, um, and I think it says a lot about the strength and grit that's required. So, uh, all right. I don't want to, I mean, I have like a whole, I have tons more questions we could talk about, but I don't, I feel like we are reaching the end here. So yeah. I want to leave time. Yeah. We do the speed round. I know I have a I have a lightning round but uh, I don't know are there, are, <laughs> okay okay do we have time for that Naomi uh, yes 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 Go okay okay all right so I have a fun lightning round which the panelists have been prepared for so it sounds like they're all prepared um let's go Tanya Lizzie Miriam Stevie okay there's five questions the first one is the hardest working tool in my kitchen is? The rubber spatula. You have to get every last drop. <laughs> in, my, in the home kitchen, I would say it's definitely my kitchen aid. The kitchen aid mixer, that thing. I just bought a new one today because the other one died. Like I, I just go through them, I kill them. I don't know, they're That's not impressive. big enough. <laughs> Um, I would say my kitchen knife with my bench scraper as a close second. Mm. Tongs. Tongs? Tongs. <laughs> yeah, for everything. I don't know pads. If I need to get something off the top shelf, I use it for everything. Tongs. <laughs> uh, you need one of those grabby hand things for the top shelf. No, I just need tongs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, question number two, the family recipe I am still trying to master is? Tanya. We're going in this order again? Same, Ooh. we're just gonna oh, keep going. Okay. I mean, I feel like I've kind of mastered them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's kind of a, yeah. that was a trick question I, for I, you. I'll, okay. <laughs> <I'm good>. yeah. <laughs> I'll say my dad's, uh, his chicken curry that he used to make, I mean, I can make it, but it's every time I make it, I'm like, is this as good as dad's? It'll never, I don't know. It just never be. It's not his one, you know? Um, the mutton kima recipe from my grandmother. Still oh. trying. Wow. Deemed cool. artichokes. Deemed artichokes. <laughs> oh. So surprising. Okay. Question number three. I am hosting an imaginary dinner party and I would love for each of you to bring a guest. What culinary, wine, literary, or art hero, living or dead, would you bring to the party? Tanya. 
I think I'm, I'm going to bring MFK Fisher. Um, she's been coming to mind lately. I've had a couple just inquiries, conversations. And I remember when I bought The Art of Eating and just, you know, how much I absorbed it, just that reading her vivid descriptions. So she was actually one of the first uh, writers that I started reading at the beginning of writing this book, too. Perfect. This was a really hard one to choose just one for me. Um, but I have to say Marcella Hazan, the late Marcella Hazan, she, her books I love and I love her sort of, sort of, you know, she's just so easy with the way she cooks and just her demeanor. She's not pretentious in any way. I just love that she's, she just cooks, you know. Did Miriam already go? No, nope. I didn't go, I didn't go. I have my, I have so many that like fled. So oh my gosh, it's too many. Um, but honestly, if I could sit down, I could learn about the Kima recipe if I invited Mater Joffrey. So I think I'm going to invite Mater Joffrey to my, to my dinner party. This is going to be a great party. I'm so excited. Okay. This is very, very difficult question. But I have settled on um, a winemaker named Tamuna, and I can never, I don't know how to say her last name, Bidzin, Bidzinashvili. She is a Georgian young woman winemaker who makes like some of the most profound wines that I've had in my career. And I just got turned down to her and um, everything about her culture, her winemaking and her approach to her products are incredibly inspiring. And I want to be her friend. <laughs> Can't, I mean, we really could throw a great party. Um, okay, last question. Number four, you'd be surprised to know that I sometimes drink blank. Oh, yikes. Um, oh, I'll go. Yeah. Okay. I can down like an ice cold beer. Like if I'm really thirsty, it's like the best thing ever. Full circle to the pub crawl. The no, aforementioned no. pub crawl. And I don't really <laughs> drink beer, but if I'm really thirsty and ice cold beer, like just chug it, so delicious. <laughs> Okay, Tanya. I mean, I basically drink water and wine, so I can't, <laughs> I can't really think of anything that would surprise anyone. I don't. Um, you don't drink like your gravy from time to time. Just <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. I, I would. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking around. I'm trying to. Honey, <laughs> it's a Bloody Mary apple, on Sunday morning. It's like. Vinegar, apple cider vinegar you know I start the morning with the tablespoon of that wow um, that it. is hard that's hardcore <laughs> <laughs> that's just, like, I'm, good for you I don't know yeah I'm like a, a big fermentation fan so um I think maybe it would be surprising but I'm not really sure that I do pickle backs from time to time if, if in the right mood so wow wow but I made the pickle juice myself <laughs> Wine industry professionals and sommeliers um, are disappointed to know that I love New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Oh. <laughs> shame, shame, shame. <laughs> okay, that was, that was it for the New lightning. A glass of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc once saved my life in an airport when I got stuck for like same and I was like oh it is the go Kim Crawford I love you today yeah. Kim Crawford <laughs> is the go-to wine whenever there's not really wine <laughs> and then you the guy the gentleman who was kind enough to get it he was I was I took a sip because I was just just something white I took a sip but, oh I was like oh Kim Crawford and he goes oh how did you know and I was like everyone knows <laughs> Uh, oh my gosh. Well, thank you for indulging that um, lightning round. That was really fun. I got some here. Any more questions that, that you have, Lindsay? I mean, I think we have a wrapped audience, but we can also move on to Q&A. Um, no, I mean, I think, I think I'm good. If there are audience questions, I'd love to hear them. Cool. Um, if you have a question, you can totally unmute yourself and just start talking, um, or you can type it into the chat box and I'll read it out loud. Uh, 
have a question while we wait. Go for it. <laughs> Can we see the book? That was my question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The book. yeah. Actually, thank you for bringing that up because I did, I did earmark your pages. So this is Lizzie's recipe for citrus almond polenta cake. And these um, plates that I illustrated are from all the generations of women in her family. And the cake is delicious. I love those and... illustrations so much, Lindsay. It's just so oh, beautiful. Good. Those I... plates were so fun to look at. Um, and then here's my portrait of Tanya in her kitchen yeah. at, uh, at Brown Sugar Kitchen. So good. So it's lovely. Looking oh, fierce. For you. So as a sometimes writer, you know, you hit like, like writer's block. Like, did you hit painter's block <laughs> with particular stories or chefs or like where you were like, I can't quite figure out what to paint or this isn't evoking what I want it to. Was that a thing? Yeah, totally. Um, also, that's an interesting question because um, I didn't even really realize this until I started talking about the book when it came out in early March. But uh, I mean, I did, but I hadn't really said it out loud that I painted all of the, the illustrations um, I would say 90% of the illustrations were painted during lockdown. So um, I had sketched the whole book, like the whole book was already sketched because that was part of the process of designing it and laying up, laying it out with all of the, um, all of the text and the manuscript. Um, so I knew what the general direction was, but of course, taking something from sketch to painting is, uh, a process in and of itself and then doing it um, when school has been canceled in the middle of a global pandemic is a whole nother thing so um, you know it was it was really interesting it was um, of course I had those moments but many times that I was painting it just felt like solace honestly like I had spent so much time with each of these stories and um all of the words and parsing every every detail. I don't know if my, I, I think my editor, Rachel, might be here tonight if you are with Rachel um, from Workman. And um, I, you know, we, hi, Rachel. <laughs> uh, it was such a, such a detailed process and I was learning so much the whole time and um, getting to the, final illustration stage was such a joy it was like it was like the icing on the cake or you know whatever cooking analogy you want to insert here um it was it was really um it was really really special and it felt like the ultimate way for me to honor the people that make this book uh so meaningful to me I mean everyone's stories it was like it was like meditating on everyone's stories. Did a great job. Thanks. Any other questions out there? Do you want to know where you can buy it from Napa Bookmine? <laughs> um, why I don't have a copy with me because they were sell they are selling so well. You will be happy. Oh. There are like three, or three copies left. So I just didn't want to like take it in case um, people were going to want it tonight, you know, um, but they're, they'll be there and we're getting more in. So. Yay. That's great. And I can send um, the ones that I, I think you had some signed copies, but I'm happy to send more if that's something people are interested in. Oh, nice. Awesome. Yeah. 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 Just let us know. We'll connect all that. Um, cool. Well, wow, such a great event. It's not every, um, it's not every author event that I like am wiping tears. So oh. thanks, um, thanks y'all for that great conversation. And thank you for just taking time out of your lives to um, talk amongst each other so we could listen to all of these words of wisdom. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for everybody who came um, and being part of this ongoing conversation. I feel like uh, it has been beyond my wildest expectations that uh, what started as these little conversations would be continuing three years later. And um, it's, I hope that it keeps continuing. If you do get to see the book, um, I hope that this conversation keeps going in your own life. So. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I can't wait to come to California and visit and see all of you and you. see your new the restaurants reopening and the and eat all the food and drink all the wine. Can't wait. Yes. Pub crawl. <laughs> Pub crawl. <laughs> On our um, YouTube channel, um, probably tomorrow the next day. So yeah, look out. Awesome. Thank you so much. Right. Oh. Send us Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Naomi. Thanks, Lindsay. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.